some people ask, how did you get to where you're at? I said, I don't know. I just kind of stumbled along and made mistakes along the way, but just kept trying to follow the Lord. So here we are. How many have been sensing the waves of the Holy Spirit moving around the room? I was watching, John Wimber used to word it this way, the dancing hand of God is moving around the auditorium. And I sensed the dancing hand of God back there. Uh, yeah, th yeah, you with your hands up and the sister right to your right. Uh, could you just stand, both of you? In fact, all three of you right there. No, yeah, yeah, you, no, you, yeah. You three right there. Uh, right here, yeah, you too. I sense a glory cloud over the top of you and God telling me today is your day of promotion, that he's imparting a greater authority to you, not just for you, but the Lord wants you to know it's for your family. You are making a way for the next generation to come in behind you. He said, you, the, you've not been perfect, but he says, according to his word, in his eyes, you are altogether perfect. The enemy would try to bring shame and condemnation, but the Lord says, you have been altogether perfect and you're getting better day by day, day by day. And there's been, there's a prophetic anointing in your family line that goes back at least three to four generations. And Lord is using all of you to reclaim and purify that line because you're through you, he's creating a brand new legacy for those that are coming behind you. So just keep standing there right now. Holy Spirit, would you anoint them right now that the power of God come upon them with the fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit. God bless you. Um, I, I saw this too for my brother came up in it and said hi to me the other day, David Harris, and I hardly recognize him. I haven't kept up with what's gone on, but him and his wife, who, who were key people in, years ago in my life through their worship, um, and I was so blessed by that. But David, after you walked out of the room, and this, I, I've been hesitant to even share anything because it was kind of shocking to me. So I haven't kept up with what's gone on, but the Lord showed me the enemy writing your death certificate. But the Lord said, no, 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 that for such a time as this, you are here and you're going to continue. You've been through at least two to three other transitions in your life, and through those transitions, the enemy has attempted to take you out completely. But the Lord says, live, 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 life, 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 and he's touching you even right now from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. And every cell in your body is aware this very second of the presence of the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord says, live, 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 live. You're not done yet. You and your wife are not done yet. In fact, from this day forward, a chapter is closing and a new one is getting ready to open. Both of you just stand up right where you're at. Holy Spirit, touch them right now with life, 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 a new season, new, 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 new chapter, new chapter, new chapter, new chapter. In fact, there's new songs that have been brooding inside of you, stirring inside of you, and there's a writing gift on both of your lives about the testimony of what God's brought you through. You're gonna help bring life, resurrection life, to many, many, many more in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for that. Well, I'm done. Tom, I'm kidding, kidding. Uh, I have a, I, a little bit of a difficult uh, thing to pull off here. When a, a couple of the other individuals here that were uh, contributing, speaking, um, heard about what I was sharing yesterday. There's, you've got to share that stuff today, you know, on Sunday. You've got to share that on Sunday, and I, I just don't know how I might be able to do that, but I'm gonna, I am going to highlight a few things uh, as I continue uh, with what I, I feel like God has given me for you all. Um, and it was titled, Putting God's Power on Display. 
But I want to start off with saying congratulations to you all. You have entered into what the Lord calls a fullness of time season. It's the perfect timing in God's alignment of everything that he's doing. And you're all participants in something bigger than yourself that you're going to walk into and walk out under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Fullness of time, season, but the Lord showed me, and uh, I, I would include myself in this, and if you're honest, I'm sure many of you would do the same thing. You've had a lot of setbacks, or am I the only one? But the Lord says, you've had your setback, but get ready for your comeback under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And if you're like me, I would say it's been more like a full-blown beatdown. How many would say it's been more like a beatdown? If it's been more like a beatdown, the Lord says, get ready for your turnaround. The, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He's about to put his power on display through you, his kids. You all know many spiritual fathers like John Paul Jackson, Bob Jones, Paul Kane, and others have gone home to be with the Lord. And that marked a pivotal change in the kingdom of God here on earth. It's no longer about the big names and the famous ones. This season is all about the everyday person rising up and taking their place and walking out what God has called you to be. And we've all been blessed by a lot of those leaders that have gone home to be with the Lord, but the Lord says, now it's your turn. It's your time. And what I was sharing yesterday regarding prophetic ministry Other than to share with you what the Lord told me after my mentor, John Paul Jackson, went home to be with the Lord. He said, now it's the sons and daughters day to rise up and release their unique expression of their prophetic gifting. Not to be a clone of the others that have come before, but to be their own unique expression of what God has put inside of you. And the days of people like myself and others releasing all these prophetic loose cannons, releasing them to go out and prophesy all over the world or whatever, and then I'm getting phone calls from pastors and leaders asking, what did you do to these individuals? Because we can't hear a word they're saying because their character is shouting louder than their gift. What God is saying today, and I'm just saying this is what he's spoken to me, is that he's raising up a generations of Joseph's, Daniel's, and Esther's that are gifted prophetically, but they will be ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Ambassador-type quality. It's me and you. It's our turn. But the Lord has raised the bar with what he's releasing today. Are you ready for this? It's his gifted people going out and releasing their unique expression, but it's less about the gift you're carrying and more about the presence you're releasing. That's what it's going to be all about. It's the love of the Father emanating through you and unlocking hearts, releasing dreams, giving solutions to business leaders, politicians, world leaders, school teachers, janitors, whoever he sends you to. It's about you walking in, and it's all about the presence of his love that you're carrying into that room. It'll change the atmosphere, it'll drive out darkness, and it will release the realm of the kingdom of heaven 
And that's what the Lord wants released. It's not really realizing you've got a prophetic gift and now you want to be in Charisma magazine. Be yourself. Everybody else is taken. So putting God's power on display. Let me begin with a, a section of scripture as a little bit of a backdrop. And it's Isaiah 60. The background to this is the community of returned exiles struggled to believe that God was still working in their midst. Aren't you sensing that out there at times? People are wondering, is God still around? Is God still doing things? That's what the community of exiles were feeling and experiencing. They regained possession of the land as promised, but they were barely existing. The community of God's people were in the condition, not in any condition to be a light to the nations. The returned exiles faced severe problems. Part of the reason was that the people had allowed disobedience and sin to pervert their mission as God's people. Compromise is a curse out there in, in the land today. People compromising their walk with God, trying to fit in to the world's culture versus the kingdom of God culture. In chapter 60, the prophet renews the promises of a new day for the community of faith. He assures the people that God has not forgotten them and that their mission as a light to the world has not changed. Do you realize that is still your mission? To be a light. Isaiah 60 says, arise and shine. In Hebrew, shine and light are two forms of the same word. We could translate this, give light, for your light has come. We are meant to be a reflection of his light, his presence. Nations will come to your light. And what is the, what is the Great Commission? To disciple nations. The question is, how bright is your light today? 2 Corinthians 3.17, now the Lord is the spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is Spirit. I was sharing with the group yesterday about this word transition. It's one of my areas of expertise as a coach. Transition, transition, transition. Do you get tired of hearing that word? Do you know what that even means? It's to bring about change. And I have this saying in the coaching world, change is imminent, growth is optional. The purpose for which God created you for never changes, but the assignments leading to it will, which will bring about change, which will press you and squeeze you to get you to begin to change your lifestyle again and again and again. We're all being formed more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, reflecting his glory, reflecting his light. But how much can he trust you with? Joseph Daniel and Esther were created to bring a shift in the land where God was taking them. You and I have been created to bring about a shift wherever it is that God has planted you. Favor comes with a cost. In Joseph's case, the favor that was on Joseph's life remained dormant till it was sown into the soil of somebody else's need. Your favor will remain dormant until it's sown into the soil of someone else's need that God has called you to go and bring influence to. Too often we go to the wrong places or we think it's all happening on Sunday morning. It's happening 24 seven if you're aware of his presence and you're listening to his voice. Favor comes with a cost, but we were all created 
to bring about a shift wherever it is that God has called you. As ambassadors of the kingdom of God, I'm calling you all ambassadors. So that's what the word of God says we all are as servants of the Lord. And what are ambassadors called to? Theologians? What is it? Yeah? Ministry of Reconciliation. The Ministry of Reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. God making his appeal through us to others to be reconciled to God. And maybe it's in the business world. Maybe it's in the political world. Maybe it's in the school systems, but you're walking in as God's ambassador and you're noticing things are just not right in the school systems. How many know the school systems need the presence of God? Our children need his presence. Our children need an ambassador like yourself. The teachers, the heads of the school systems need ambassadors to come alongside them to be a bright light to show them the way according to God's principles. We are therefore ambassadors. It's God making his appeal through us be reconciled to God. Advancing the kingdom of God. Romans 14, 17, God, kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, the result of making right that which is wrong. Making right by the love of God, flooding into that situation or in that circumstance to make right what has been made wrong. Righteousness in this context could easily be translated justice. And I'm sure many of you have your own stories of how God brought justice to you. Many of you after yesterday's workshop were asking, so how did you, how did you come to Christ? How did, you know, how, how did God reach you? I'm going to have to do it very in a very sh short story. But I was I was raised Catholic, had a sense of knowledge of God, but went the other direction in college. It was a tail end of the what was known on the West Coast as the Jesus People Revival. How many have heard of that? John Wimber used to say it this way, it, there were so many people getting saved, a pastor could get up, sneeze in front of the microphone, and people would run forward for salvation. I didn't know what was happening, I was out partying. Living in the Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach area, I came home, I think it was around Thanksgiving, to see my parents, they answered the door, both of them standing there at the door. I looked at their face and thought, oh no. The Christians got them. <laughs> they had that Christian smile. One by one, one, all my friends that I went to high school with were getting, I was finding out they'd become Christians and I thought, oh no. Felt like, you know, in prison terms, dead man walking. It's just a matter of time. They might track me down at any point. You know, I'd go to a pub there in Hermosa Beach, come out at, at uh, two or two in the morning, and there'd be Christians standing there with that smile on their face, telling me about a call of God on my life. You talk about a way to 
ruin a good buzz. <laughs> They're telling you about Jesus and you're out partying. Then a friend of mine that I grew up with right around the corner from my parents, his name's Tim Story. I don't know if you've ever heard his name. He was responsible for starting the Hollywood Bible study in Diane Cannon's living room. And it grew so big they had to move it to a hotel in Hollywood. But he was still going to seminary at the time. And I, every time I'd come home, he would show up. I'd be down in the park smoking a joint with some friends. And here comes Tim Story with that smile on his face, telling me about a call of God on my life. And I was started getting rude with him, blowing the smoke in his face and just trying to get him to leave me alone. But he just was determined to love me into the kingdom of God. No matter what I did, he just kept loving me and telling me about this call that he knows God has on my life and God was going to make it happen one way or the other. Every time I went to visit my parents, Tim Story would walk up to tell me about Jesus. I went to go play some indoor racquetball with some friends I graduated from high school with, and while I was in there playing racquetball, about fourth or fifth game in, we we're playing doubles. And I crumbled to the floor, thinking the guy behind me hit me in the back of my leg with his racket. I got up, and I couldn't walk. I tried to walk, and I had to go like this out of the court. I reached back there, and thought, doesn't feel right. I didn't go to the doctors that day. A friend took me the next morning. Doctor looked at it, had me lay on my stomach. He said, watch me when I squeeze your left calf. My foot went like this. He says, watch when I squeeze your right calf, and my foot just hung there. He says, you have a complete rupture of your right Achilles tendon. It completely tore away from your heel. Emergency surgery in the morning. It's getting towards holiday time. There's, I'm in the hospital. They do surgery. None of my friends came to visit. Nobody I knew came to visit except Tim Story comes walking in with the smile on his face, holding a good news Bible in his arm, He's smiling at me. He laughed a little bit, and you know why? He had a captive audience now. I wasn't going anywhere. And he was telling me all about the Lord and what the Lord showed him about me. And he left the Bible there. I was in that hospital room for 10 days. And it gave me a lot of time to think about my life. And for the first time, I realized my life was spinning completely out of control and there was no way to pull it back together. I had no insurance. Everything I owned I was selling to try to make money to pay the hospital bills. None of my friends that I partied with came to visit except Tim Story kept showing up and told me that his Bible study in his mom's house had been praying for me for over five years. And he says, I have to tell you, Phil, I had, I had faith for anybody to get saved, but with you, I wasn't too sure. But he was just determined to keep loving me into the kingdom. And I wasn't a Christian yet at that point when I got back home and he continued to come and visit. And I knew all my friends, a lot of friends, friends were getting born again and one afternoon, I thought I was literally about ready to go completely insane, literally. I had my hand on the telephone, and I was ready to call a doctor to come get me because I thought I was about to go crazy. I fell out of the chair 
and prayed one of the most dangerous prayers anybody could pray. God, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. But then I had a list. You can't use my parents. You can't use Tim's story. And I listed every friend I knew that was born again that could have any contact with me. I said, God, you can't use any of them. I thought if he's real, I just made it very, very hard on him. <laughs> Next day, phone rings. They say, Phil, it's for you. I went in got on the phone, and it's a young lady. She says, Phil, do you remember me? Um, we went out two years ago, and um, I said, oh, yeah, how are you doing? She says, oh, I'm doing great. She says, you know, three months ago, I gave my heart to Jesus. <laughs> Looked at the list. I missed one. <laughs> she says, the crazy thing is, she said, I was packing my apartment to move to a new location, got to the bottom of one, one of my drawers, and there was a slip of paper with your name and phone number on it, and she says, the crazy thing is, I think I heard God say, call him, he's finally ready. You can't make this up. My knees buckled at that very second, and she said, my Friends and I are going to a concert at Calvary Chapel, uh, and we just felt led to invite you, and we'd come get you and, and bring you back. At that point, I was scared to say no. What might happen there? So I went and heard the gospel preached for the first time at this Calvary Chapel concert, and those of you that may date you if you heard these bands, but one of them was named Petra. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard the gospel preached for the first time. People went up to get saved. I didn't go up, but I, I was just completely blown away, having been raised Catholic, where everything was very structured or whatever. But these were guitars. These were drums. These were, you know, loud music. And young people in there enjoying this atmosphere. And I just couldn't get it out of my head. Like, is this church? They took me back home. I walked in the front door. I got to hurry up and finish this. I walked in the front door of the house, and it's as if this hot, wet, weighty presence fell on my head and shoulders, so much so my knees buckled. I was bouncing off one side of the hallway to the other. I couldn't walk, and then fell in the door to the bedroom and kicked the door shut. Not sure what was happening. I thought, I might be dying here. I don't know what's going on. It's as if every cell in my body was trembling violently, and all I could do was grab a pillow and put it over on my face, and I began screaming at the top of my lungs. So much so, blood vessels broke on my no you know, around my nose and face area. It was that intense of an experience. I was unable to move. I was violently trembling on the floor for God knows how long. How many know when the God's presence comes in like that, a, a, a one minute could seem like an hour? And I don't know how long it was, but it finally began to lift at one point. I was able to crawl to the bed and pulled myself up because I still could not get up on my feet because of the presence of God. And I tried to go to sleep and I couldn't go to sleep. And then I heard this voice. Go over there to your drawer, yeah, the bottom drawer, and get all those baggies of marijuana and flush it all down the toilet. I said, that can't be God. So I kept trying to ignore it, and it began to get more and more stern. Go over there and take all those baggies of marijuana and flush it all down the toilet. I said, that's not God. He gave us plants for our enjoyment. It's part of the beauty of his creation. Then I started trying to negotiate with him. I'll sell it and give you 10%. <laughs> flush it down the toilet. Okay! And I went and got it and all, flushed it all down the toilet, laid back down, went right to sleep. Woke up in the morning, my eyeballs shot open. I, did I do what I think I did? It was close to 10 years of waking up every single day, getting high and going to bed, getting high. 
over. I realized I didn't want to get high anymore. That's when I knew God did a miracle. A crazy example of somebody that was used as God's ambassador to come alongside me, not shame me, condemn me, but loved me into the kingdom of God. Prayed me, loved me into the kingdom of God. Every chance he could. This was God using him with the ministry of reconciliation to bring justice to somebody that was in severe bondage. How might God use you to come alongside somebody else? You have no idea. Quick story, I've been on the radio in northern in Vermont, WVMT AM 620. I got invited to come on to their, this radio station called the Charlie Ernie and Lisa Radio Show uh, to teach, to share a little bit about leadership and then they opened up the phone lines and they allowed me to interpret dreams for callers and prophesy to them non-religiously, the secular radio station. One morning this gentleman calls, he, he, retired, he um, retired from the military who had been having tormenting nightmares since he was deployed to Iraq. So much so he was on medication, he started drinking again, couldn't sleep, dreaded going to sleep every night. Knowing that it was getting dark, he began to tremble inside and get nauseous knowing it was almost bedtime and he dreaded going to sleep because of this nightmare he would have. So he shares this nightmare on, on the radio and I began to share with him a little bit of what I sensed this thing was and I gave him something I use in the coaching world, and that's this. The fears you run from run to you. The issues in your life that you run from will continue running to you until they are confronted. In this dream, he had this, he knew, he didn't know what it looked like, but this, he knew it was a, tor this a horrible monster that wanted to kill him, was chasing him. And it was so intense and so severe that he would wake up, sometimes throwing up, trembling in fear. So off the air, I talked to him a little bit more at length and told him this is something having to do with lucid dreaming. If you have this same type of dream again and again and again and you are losing, you can get used to that dream and in the dream, turn around and confront whatever it is that's coming after you. So I taught him how to do that the next time he went to sleep. Guess what? He did do that, and he locked eyes with this tormenting demon. And when the demon realized he wasn't running, it ran. And that torment ended that night. Long story short, he knew only God could have done this. He gave his heart to the Lord, came to Christ, got his marriage restored, got a job, and he's off all the, all the medication that he'd been on for years. God bringing justice, and again, I'm wanting to tell you, just like I told the group yesterday, your gift will make room for you, but how serious are you about the gifts and calling of God in your life? Whatever it is, you have the ministry of reconciliation. And God wants to display his power through you, through that gift. But you have to be about what God has called you to do. The ministry of reconciliation. And I didn't, uh, I have to just be honest with you, it was easy. I didn't have to convince him that God is real. Me just giving him what he needed to hear and do, God revealed himself through that and showed himself more powerful than the demon that was tormenting him. So how do we enter into this ministry of being an ambassador of the kingdom of God? I want to just get back to basics real quick. 
First Peter 2.12 says this in this interpretation. Live an exemplary life before the Gentiles, thereby, ref thereby refuting their prejudices and winning them over to God's side so they'll be there for the celebration when he arrives. Live an exemplary life amongst the Gentiles, thereby refuting their prejudices. You'll win them over to God's side so they'll be there for the celebration when he arrives. First, it's about our lifestyle. As an ambassador, what type of lifestyle should you be modeling to the world? It's got to be anchored in the love of the Father. For my sisters back there, to tell them what the Father had for them, about their destiny and their future, about creating a pathway for the next generation to come. That should give them hope that God has powerful things for them in the future. When you're giving prophetic words to people, are you first sensing the love of the Father for that individual, wanting nothing but the best for them? People that don't know Christ especially, they already know they're sinners, they just don't know that God loves them. Once they know their love, they want to get rid of their junk. And you step in all the more at that point and show them how that might happen. But all the while, you're loving them. All the while, it's that love in your lifestyle that's, that's being manifest to everybody you come into contact with. I had a haircutting place that I used to go to in New Haven, Connecticut when I was living there before Catherine and I got married. And I would show up during the middle of the week because I was always traveling. I'd come back on Sunday night or sometimes Monday. So I'd go and get a haircut maybe on Wednesday or Thursday. And so after like three months, um, I walked in and they said, you know, we've kind of been talking and wondering what is it you do for a living? because you show up when most people are working. So-and-so over there thinks you might work for the FBI. <laughs> or so-and-so over there, and now they all had different ideas. And uh, uh, I said, well, you know, I'm more like a spiritual activist. And uh, I said, I like to tell people how much God loves them, and I like to interpret dreams for them to show them that God still speaks to people even at night. And they said, oh, really? So ever since then, when I'd show up, they would have all their dreams written out. And so as I'm getting a scalp massage, I'm interpreting dreams and prophesying to the other ladies. And they said, you know what, we enjoy, and they pulled me aside as I was paying for my haircut one time. And they said, you know, we really enjoy you doing all of that. But they said, but you know what we like even more? I said, what's that? They said, every time you show up, the chaos, atmosphere of chaos, leaves the salon, and the place is full of peace. Again, it's about the presence. Sure, it's connected to you, but it's pointing to is, who is the king of all peace, Jesus Christ. It's about the presence that you're carrying. You can, it creates a, a platform for you to point to who is giving this peace. And it was a, a few months after that, the girl that was cutting my hair came to me and said, you know what? She said, she was crying. She said, I was diagnosed with cancer. She said, I wasn't feeling well, and my husband's a mess, and I, I'm scared that I might die. And she was going on and on and on about what, what had transpired. And I said, do you mind if I pray for you? I said, I like to pray for people that, and, and see them get well. Long story short, prayed for her. She had another appointment to do the final testing before surgery, and they couldn't find the tumor. But it all begins realizing you are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. 
You are one reconciling somebody to the King of Kings. You are the one that God wants to use to speak life to somebody. God wants to put his power on display for you. Proclamation without deeds is dead. Paul said, I preached the full gospel, both in what I said and what I did. Is the power of God being put on display in your life and through you to touch others? Okay, we're going to get down to where the rubber meets the road here. Jesus' church, or Jesus' ecclesia, are you ready for this? Was a building less mobile people movement designed to operate 24 7 in the marketplace for the purpose of having an impact, impact on everybody and everything. One more time. Jesus' ecclesia was a buildingless mobile people movement designed to operate 24-7 in the marketplace for the purpose of having an impact on everybody and everything. It's not all about a conference setting. It's not all about Sunday morning church setting. It's about all week long realizing you're part of a people movement representing the kingdom of God as an ambassador with the ministry of reconciliation everywhere you go. Both in prayer, lifestyle, and what comes out of your mouth as you're encouraging others. Remember I shared this out of Proverbs. Anxiety and fear, or anxious fear, or anxiety and fear leads to depression, but a life-giving word of encouragement can do wonders to restore joy to the heart. If we could become a people that are releasing encouraging words, will transform hearts, restore joy. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, bring reconciliation with the love of God. Once that happens, it releases peace, like in that hair salon. Peace, which restores joy. And that's what God wants to do through you and I 24-7. Realize we are a people movement. It's not about a building, but people moving under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, recognizing you are representing a kingdom. You're representing a king with the love of God to bring reconciliation everywhere you go. And what is our, some of our agenda, I guess? How about victory over poverty as ambassadors of the kingdom of God? In Acts chapter 4, it says, there was no needy person among them. Releasing as ambassadors of the kingdom of God to eradicate poverty from our communities. It's what the early disciples, it's the early church was all about. Wherever there was need, they would bring resource. What else? Why did the church spread so quickly? Do you realize or understand why or how? That was the liberation of an entire people group. The early church liberated the women of God. And God is still doing that today. Ladies, women of God, Jesus says you are free. You are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. You are going to be used in powerful ways to help advance the kingdom of God. As ambassadors, as part of the ecclesia, how about the restoration of family? What was it said about Zacchaeus? Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. 
Was he preaching? Was he doing miracles inside Zacchaeus' house? He showed up to have fellowship and dinner with them. Salvation came to Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus' family and business had all experienced salvation. That wasn't just Zacchaeus receiving salvation, but the entire family and his business came under the realm of the kingdom of God because of the love of Jesus Christ that was manifest in his home. And that same love that came to Zacchaeus' house can come everywhere you go. The atmosphere changes and peace comes. Joy is restored because encouragement is released. We're not condemning or shaming or trying to fix them or trying to get them, you know, browbeating them with, with scriptures to get them to repent of their lifestyle. But how about loving them into the kingdom like Tim Story did to me? And how about tormenting them with that smile till they finally surrender? Breaking the cycle of unrighteousness, like in the prison systems. How many are involved in ministry in the prisons? Do you understand how powerful that is? I don't know who, who, who gets more encouraged when you, when you go there to do that. Anytime I've ever done it, I walked away more encouraged than they, they were. I was at an inner city ministry called Blood and Fire in downtown Atlanta, and it was time for, the, uh, for everybody that was sleeping there. It was over 200 homeless, homeless people sleeping in this warehouse. So what they would do is they would form like a gauntlet. So for all the homeless people that were sleeping there, they would walk through this tunnel, so to speak, and every person they came up to, everyone was hugging them. So by the time they got to the food, they had been hugged about 100 times and told how much they're loved. But it, what was interesting as I was watching that go on, the homeless people were smiling and loved getting hugged, but all the people that were doing the hugging were doing all the crying. They were getting blessed by the Holy Spirit as they were hugging these individuals. One time I was taking a team of young men with me to the Union Rescue Mission in downtown on Skid Row in Los Angeles. We used to go two times a month and do a, a worship, worship time and then ministry time for, for all the men there. As I was walking in with these young men, down the way, there was this homeless man in army fatigues with black boots on that were so worn out that his toes were sticking out of the boots. His feet were so dirty, they were just black. His toenails had curled over and had punctured the skin so there was dried blood on his toes. And he was smiling really big when he saw us walking in. And he was starting to walk towards us. And the young men with me said, Phil, what, 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 do, we, what do we do? And I said, I don't know. And he's walking. He was a big, imposing guy, tattooed all over, had big beard. And he was smiling from ear to ear as he's walking towards us. And as he's getting closer, I could, I'm going to be a little graphic here, I could smell him. It was overwhelming stench. He was that dirty. And as he's getting closer, the scent is getting stronger. And then I hear the Lord whisper in my ear. He says, son, I want you to grab him and hug him. I'm thinking, I just took a shower. I'm nice and clean. He's getting closer, getting closer. And then he throws open his arms. And I reached over and grabbed him and pulled him to my chest. And he crumbled to the ground, screaming at the top of his lungs and asking Jesus to help him. He came to Christ right there and then the Holy Spirit whispers in my ear and says, see son, it's not about you. I wanted him to feel my presence. 
Two days later, I got a phone call from the head of the Union Rescue Mission to tell me that he went home to be with the Lord. You have no idea how God is going to touch those that he sends you to. They'll be the unlovely, the castaways, the throwaways, the ones society says have no value. But God says, I love them. The question is, how open are you to hug the unlovely? Those that society says have no value. And God says, my, I sent my son for that man. The ministry of reconciliation. You don't have to memorize all kinds of scripture and have all kinds of preaching messages ready. Just be ready to love people and love them right where they're at. Affirm them right where they're at. God does all the hard work. Breaking the cycle of unrighteousness in the prison systems, in the homeless shelters, the rescue missions, the sex trafficking that's going on all over the world. How many know God wants to send more ambassadors that direction as well? To break the cycle of unrighteousness in the sex trafficking that's going on all over the world. It's happening in Vermont. It's happening in Canada. It's happening everywhere. And God wants to bring an end to it. How about to drug addiction, alcoholism, breaking the cycle of unrighteousness? I shared a story. Um, I started a halfway house in Oceanside, California. And this, uh, I was given the opportunity to take this. It was from a foundation that took over a house in downtown Oceanside, right near the gang area, the Crips and Bloods fighting over drug turf, right near the Oceanside Pier. I had 18 men sleeping in that house that wanted to get free from drugs and get their lives together. So I, there I was in this home with 18 men, many of them very rough, very scary looking, intimidating looking individuals. I was telling them yesterday, this one man, Big Steve, they called him. His nickname was Big Steve. He had biceps as big as most people's thighs, tattooed from head to toe. This rough, had a rough edge about him. He gave his life to the Lord. One by one, people were getting saved without any, any of us having to work very hard they just wanted to get saved. So many getting saved and delivered that other foundations were calling and asking, we hear what's happening over there in Oceanside at your uh, Samaritan house. Um, are you using the 12-step? I said, nope, so far we're only using the one step. I'm loving these men and these, this team from the Oceanside Vineyard. They would show up once a week to do Bible study and worship with them. We were just loving them towards Jesus. One, uh, one Sunday, Big Steve's coming back from church. He's walking, and you can picture this guy, ex-biker, holding his Bible under his arm, long hair, beard, and I was encouraging someone yesterday that sometimes the cigarette smoking and other things kind of linger a little bit longer, but you get free of the drugs right away sometimes. Some of the addiction, come to Christ, and then God slowly begins to clean them up. Well, that was the case for Big Steve. He shows up after church. He sits down in the living room. Here's 18 men. I'm sitting there with them all. I said, Big Steve, how was church? And he says, oh, it was awesome. I said, oh, how's Pastor, Pastor Tom? He says, oh, Pastor Tom, oh, Phil, that is a holy mf -er. I said, what, Steve? <laughs> Pastor Tom is a holy SOB. You know, he said the whole words. The cussing lingered a little longer, but he got free of heroin. He came to Christ. And sometimes everything else is a process. So 
coming alongside individuals. We don't want to shame them, condemn them, but what is Jesus doing in them? And how could you love them all the more through the whole process? How many know salvation comes quickly, but the cleaning up sometimes takes time? It was for me. I had to get all kinds of inner healing and deliverance. It was a process, breaking the cycle of unrighteousness. Could I share one more that the Lord gave me? This, I hope this encourages some of you. The Lord told me this is the season of the entrepreneur. Kingdom ambassadors in the entrepreneurial world that have been baptized in divine wisdom. Divine wisdom, it's not the world's interpretation of wisdom. Divine wisdom flows through a heart of integrity, manifests itself in creativity with excellence as the standard. God has been giving, this is what I'm sharing with you what the Lord showed me. The Lord has been giving many of you pictures and dreams about certain entrepreneurial endeavors, ideas to start businesses, but you haven't discerned that it was God yet. The Lord wants me to tell you, that was me. Begin to take it, write it down, journal it, pray over it. Many have started to embrace these ideas, but you're wondering, can it ever come to pass because it seems so out there? Could I tell you something? If it's not out of the box, it's probably not the Lord. When the present administration in, in Washington, D.C. came to office, the Lord said, out of the box and unconventional. What we're seeing in the natural, he's saying in the spiritual. What he's going to give you is going to be out of the box and unconventional. And how he's going to bring it all together will be unconventional. He gave me a vision of out of heaven, angels of finance are being released as I'm speaking to help bring the resource you need to cause it to come to pass. Because you will not do it on your own. It's out of the box and unconventional. And when you give testimony of how God brought it all together, people are going to look at you and wonder, are you on drugs? Because what he's giving you is bigger than you, and you're going to have to grow into it. Your lifestyle is going to have to change. Third John verse 2, God desires that we prosper in all things, even as our soul is prospering. God desires that we prosper spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, and materially. Doing well in all five, according to Pastor Jack Hayford. Not doing well in one or two, but shining bright in all five to be a bright light out in the midst of darkness where the world is looking for solutions and can't find them. They're going to look at you and wonder, how did this all happen? Only God could have done it. Prospering in all things, even as your soul is prospering, what is a prosperous soul but a renewed mind? God is going to change the way you're thinking to bring to pass what he's calling you to be and do. The Israelites freed from Egypt. Many didn't make it into the promised land. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Without a renewed mind, your past continues to be your future. Joshua and Caleb got a vision of the promised land and came back and gave an amazing report. With that new report and with the vision God gave them of the promised land, God freed them from the mentality of Egypt. Same with you, your past continues to bring up memories of, the, of your past, which triggers thoughts, which releases emotion, which emotions 
emit chemical in your body that your body becomes addicted to. With a new vision, it releases new thoughts about your future, which releases new emotions of excitement for that new future, which releases a new chemical which you begin to love. And your body begins to love. A renewed mind, new thought patterns, where your past doesn't dictate your future any longer. For many, and you run into them all the time, their past continues to be their future because they've not got, gotten a vision from God for their new future, where they embrace it and allow God to begin to renew their mind so they're able to walk into this new beginning. Does all this make sense? I hope so. It takes the power of God to bring it all to pass. Why is the presence of God so powerful? For so long, we've lacked the deeds to demonstrate and validate the relevance of the words in the message we preach. The deeds that accompany the message are what make it desirable and acceptable. Just a quick story. It'll probably make you laugh. When uh, one of the young men at the halfway house in Oceanside uh, got his life back together, got free of addiction, uh, got his marriage restored, got a great job, shows back up at the house with his mom. His mom wanted to thank me for what happened to her son, and they, she brought me all kinds of fresh cooked food and some pies and was thanking me, and then the young man looks at me and says, I want to I wanna buy you something. What, is there anything that you're missing? I said, you know what? I, I'm missing a dog. He says, done. Two days later, I show up at, the ho at my house. I went down to the beach for a little while, came back to my, the house. Sitting in front of my bedroom door was this box, and I could hear something rustling inside this box. Open it up, and it's a German Shepherd puppy. let this little puppy run through the house and she's running up and down the stairs and she she's um the guys all loved loved her loved her and and uh, she, uh we called her bandit because she would run up to where all the other guys bunks were and she'd steal their socks and underwear and take them outside and bury them so that we we named her bandit she was taking stuff and stealing them long story short one, one afternoon, one of the homeless guys, and you can picture this rough-looking guy, runs up, runs up to my door, and he's banging on the door, and he's saying, Phil, bandit's dead, bandit's dead, and he's crying, and all their, all their men are running over, and three of them are kneeling around bandit there in the dirt outside, and her tongue is out, and it's purple. Her eyes are rolled back, didn't look like she's breathing, and they're these big burly guys, what do we do, Phil? What do we do? I said, I, I, I was stunned. I'd say, I pray. God! And they're pleading with heaven for Bandit. And I said, lay hands on Bandit. They laid hands on Bandit, and she's, all of a sudden she coughs. Tongue goes back in. Eyes rolled back. The men jumped back. The ones that weren't saved got saved. And they were running down to the pier to tell all these other guys, God raised Bandit from the dead. From that day forward, men started showing up at the door of Samaritan House, banging on the door. Guys would open up the door, yes, could we help you? We're here to see Bandit. We heard what happened. And the men were taking them aside and trying to lead them to Christ. And some of them did come to Christ. But the power of God on display, he'll do it anywhere, anytime, if you'll just believe. Are you ready to put God's power on display? I listed off a number of things. Let me, let me start with this one. 
How many need the, min the, min the angels of finance to show up to help you bring about, let's stand right where you're at. Those that, where this resounded. You need the angels of finance to come alongside. Well, I had faith for about six, but <laughs> this is okay too. Let's all pray. Father, I ask that you would release, as you showed me in that vision, Lord, the angels of finance being dispatched from heaven to come alongside those that you have spoken to about entrepreneurial activity, to launch a business, to paint a picture, to write a book, whatever it is that God has put inside your heart, Father, would you bring angelic help to come alongside your presence, your Holy Spirit, Lord, to bring about these dreams. You are the dream giver, Lord, so we ask right now for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Heaven's help. Just, just, just begin receiving. The presence of God is brooding over you right now. Just receive. There's a few of you just need to reach a little higher. Your hands, the presence of God is right over your heads. Just begin to receive. You're going to begin to feel like electricity running into your fingertips and down your arms. Just, just receive, just receive, just receive. All over the room, all over the room. We thank you, Lord. More of your presence, more Holy Spirit. More, 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 more. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Some of you are going to begin to receive vision, even greater vision than you've had up to this point. Just receive, 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 receive. Let's be patient. There he is. Yep. There's more, 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 more. Thank you, Lord. Yep. Just right over this area, right here, right there. Just receive. There it is. There's more power. More power. Yep. Just receive. Yep. The sister right there with the pink earrings. Presence of God is all over you. Just keep receiving. Keep receiving. It, that work is going deeper, 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 deeper. And there's a few of you, and let me just continue focusing on the presence of the Lord. There's a few of you that have been bombarded with demonic activity of your mind, will, and emotions, and you've not slept through the night in months. The Lord says that season's over. Just receive your freedom right now. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it. Thank you, Lord. 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 There's a few of my sisters, just like Esther. Esther was orphaned. Some of you have felt orphaned by your circumstance in life through your family situation. Who is that? Just wave your, your hand right here, right here, back all, all over the place. Father, just like Esther, Lord, would you anoint my sisters? Would you, Lord, make the difference in their life? Make the difference in their life. Bring healing from this orphan spirit. And Lord, let your this first love experience, Lord, sweep them off their feet. Embrace them. Hold them to your heart, Lord. Let them know you are here. Yeah, just receive. Just receive. The powerful anointing on, on the women in this place right now. That you are liberated. Liberated. Liberated from unholy uh, authority figures that have uh, shut you down. You, the Lord says you are loved, you are embraced, you are affirmed, you are powerful, you are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. You are like Esther of old. You are going to walk this anointing out. Just receive it right here. Yeah, this whole row right here. Mark, would you just lay hands on this, these sisters right here? Yep, right there. In fact, the women of God that are feeling this anointing right now, would you come on up front here and just receive, receive a, a, a deeper uh, ministry right now? This is a, a, a heaven-sent experience. 
Your lives will never be the same. We might need some, uh, yeah, we will need some ministry help. Thank you, Lord. Lord, let that anointing come for them right now. Right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. There it is. There's power. Power, 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 power. Breakthrough, 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 breakthrough in Jesus' name. Breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. Yes, just receive. Sister, right here. Power, power. There's a double portion resting on you right there, right there. And I decree and I declare a chapter is ending and a new one is beginning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. For some of you, there's been witchcraft in your family line. It is cut off right now in Jesus' name. Cut off in Jesus' name. Cut off in Jesus' name. A shaman spirit has been in the family line. It's cut off in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus' name.